Okay, for this last section, I wanted to cover uh, cochlear pathophysiology in OAEs and adults. So whereas the most, um, most prevalent application of OAEs in the pediatric population is usually with uh, newborn screening primarily, uh, and then secondarily assessment of children, OAEs can also be used in differential diagnosis for adults to help differentiate, say, between um, non-organic hearing loss and, and organic hearing loss, or uh, to validate the presence of tinnitus, or to um, to determine if help determine if um, uh, vestibular schwannoma is compressing the auditory nerve uh, and, and causing cochlear dysfunction. But by far, uh, some, of the, some of the most studies in OAEs, some of the largest number of studies in OAEs, have been related to the effects of noise exposure on OAEs. And for types of noise exposure, it's quite a variety, uh, from industrial noise um, to military noise exposure, and including gunfire, uh, recreational, uh, which could include um, music, could include woodworking, um, there also have been studies that looked at ototoxicity and the interaction between ototoxic medications and uh, known ototoxic industrial solvents. But again, by far, uh, no sound-induced hearing loss or noise-induced hearing loss is going to be the, the most likely, uh, most likely uh, source of the hearing loss, uh, second only to aging. Ultimately, the exact type of noise or source of noise isn't what matters. What matters is the, the, the duration of exposure and the intensity uh, of, that, of the sound during that exposure. So there's this time intensity trading relationship between um, how intense the sound is and how long you can be exposed to it before you start to experience uh, hearing loss, whether it's temporary threshold shift or permanent threshold shift. So as the duration of the exposure tends to increase, we also see uh, greater hearing loss. And, or, or conversely, um, if the duration is fixed and the intensity increases, we start to see increasing hearing loss. So here's an example of that uh, time intensity trading relationship. This is based on OSHA maximum permitted uh, durations for exposure. The one that's most commonly cited is the 85 dBA. Above 85 dBA or at 85 dBA, uh, a worker uh, under OSHA regulation uh, can only be exposed to eight hours, eight hours of noise. We can see for every three dB increase in, in, the, uh, in the intensity level of the sound, uh, the duration permitted halves. So at 88 dBA it drops to 4 hours, at 91 dBA 2 hours, 94 dBA 1 hour. So our, our purposes for using OAEs uh, as it relates to identifying uh, or as it relates to noise, um, noise measurement uh, relate to identifying cochlear dysfunction before it happens in the conventional pure tone audiogram. Uh, identifying those who are at risk. So what I mean by that is for those individuals where OAEs may be reduced or absent, but the pure tone audiogram is still within the normal range, uh, so for th they may be at a greater risk of, um, of changes in the audiogram than another population that also has a normal audiogram but has, where they have robust OAEs. Also to monitor cochlear function in those same at-risk individuals over time. So uh, if they're exposed to noise, say if they work in a noisy environment, uh, you can monitor, any monitor for any changes over time. Um, and also to monitor the effectiveness of hearing conservation programs. So for an administrator of a hearing conservation program, they can see if hearing protection is working um, throughout their program, if there's compliance among, their, among the employees. Just like OAEs can be used to discriminate between a normal hearing and mild hearing loss in, in newborns, we can also use OAEs to discriminate between normal hearing and mild hearing loss when that mild hearing loss is due to industrial noise exposure. Um, that, that was conducted by, it was a study by Sisto and colleagues. They found that they could use DPOAEs to separate the two groups out, um, but the TEOAEs added no additional value in that particular study. We also know from a study by Shupak that um, TEOAs and DPOAs can, oh, cannot accurately 
cannot accurately um, predict f hearing loss in the future secondary to industrial noise. For example, um, the study by Shupak uh, looked at uh, persons who were exposed to noise for one, for one year of employment and they wanted to see if they could predict uh, the noise-induced hearing loss at the two-year point, and they found that there was there was a high sensitivity in the ability to identify those who had real hearing changes, but the false positive rate was far too high to be useful. And one possible reason for uh, OAEs not being able to predict uh, future changes and in, in, uh, future changes in permanent threshold shifts or hearing loss may be related to the fact that noise may not exclusively or in some cases uh, at all affect the outer hair cells. In certain situations, it's possible that n the industrial noise or noise in general might have an exclusive impact on inner hair cells and or auditory neurons. Um, there are a couple studies to support this idea, but they, they kind of go contrary to what we, we normally would think of. Uh, we normally think of the outer hair cells being affected first, but the data that supports the, uh, the, the contrary position would be a study by Avon and Bonfils when they looked at some uh, subjects, uh, 27 persons post-mortem, and they looked at their histologic samples. Uh, they found that there was predominantly um, inner, hair, inner hair cell loss, um, not outer hair cell loss. And then further supporting that notion is a, is a study by Kujo and Lieberman. Now that it was an animal study, I believe it was in mice, um, and, and they found that after noise exposure and a temporary threshold shift, uh, that once the once it once uh, the OAEs and the the thresholds ABR thresholds return to normal, uh, the super threshold ABR so it's either ABR or amplitude or latency they remained abnormal. Now I wouldn't necessarily uh, take take the message home that noise primarily affects inner hair cells. I don't think that's the case. I think noise still predominantly affects outer hair cells. But I think those studies by uh, Avon and Bonfils and Kujua and Lieberman uh, add add some additional information. Uh, they they suggest that the picture may not be quite as clear as uh, simply uh, solely affecting outer hair cells first. You can also use OAEs for hearing conservation programs. An example was uh, Bo Boxdale, I'm probably mispronouncing all of these names. An example was Boxdale, where they looked at um, using hearing protection before and after uh, their, their adult subjects uh, were sh using, using uh, guns to uh, target shoot. And they had five days of military military shooting practice, and so they measured OAEs, TEOAs, and DPOAEs uh, before. They had the subjects wear hearing protection for five days uh, straight, and then they measured the OAEs after, and they found that there was no significant change in the OAEs. And that type of data uh, supports the, uh, the use of OAEs in the hearing conservation programs for monitoring. Because we know that they're relatively sensitive to noise exposure, um, but so we can, so we can infer that if there was no change over time, to, uh, and while they're wearing hearing protection, that the hearing protection was effective. Well, I mentioned I mentioned shooting practice there, or, or so oftentimes uh, there's going to be significant exposure to firearms in the military. So here are some examples of different levels of uh, of, of different types of. Um, armaments that they that they might use in the military so we can see a handgun and machine gun 108 db uh, rifle 122 i believe these are uh, peak equivalent uh, peak spls uh, and then we also have a bazooka and other explosives so nowadays you might also have ieds for um, for veterans coming back from uh, the middle east so those are going to similarly have uh, very, very high peak SPL levels causing significant damage. So here's an example of a uh, soldier uh, using the, or just their TEOAEs before and after just shooting, shooting practice, just normal uh, shooting practice. We can see there's a uh, significant reduction in, in TEOAEs uh, in terms of the overall amplitude. We see it getting much smaller on the bottom on B compared to the top on A. And we also see this change on the right side for uh, DPOAEs as well. Both TEOAEs and uh, DPOAEs have been shown to 
be accurate at discriminating between you know those those military recruits who have a history of noise exposure versus those who don't and there was normal audiograms for both both groups they were matched in that way so that was interesting and again this is more support that TEOEs and DPOEs can detect subclinical uh, dysfunction in in outer hair cell physiology uh, OAEs there was a study by Miller and colleagues where they they looked at uh, Mili uh, they looked at um, uh, military personnel aboard an aircraft carrier over the period of I think at least six months and on this the aircraft carrier there's pretty much no quiet area anywhere you're at you have uh, greater than 85 dBA levels of noise and of course depending on what your job is there you may it may be considerably greater than that and so the, uh, Miller and colleagues looked at using OAEs to uh, to kind of assess whether or not they could predict a permanent threshold shift over time um, and they did indicate that OAEs were able to have some predictive power uh, over that six month period that they could use OEs to predict whether so so if someone coming in uh, on the aircraft carrier on the baseline if they already had an absent or a reduced OAE they were more likely to uh, have a permanent threshold shift we have recreational sports or recreational activities in general, uh, sporting events, so football games. Uh, football games definitely are going to be one of the loudest. Maybe basketball games as well. In other parts of the world, soccer games are going to be uh, are going to be qu quite popular, and you'll have uh, high high levels of noise exposure there, albeit for a short duration of time, typically just a few hours. But if you say have a local uh, local college that where you attend sporting events on a regular basis and you might do that on a weekly basis during the season uh, that duration of noise exposure can add up uh, we know in the Midwest areas in particular hunting is quite quite popular and that the vast majority of hunters do not wear hearing protection woodworking is, is quite a common activity uh, recreational activity as well and then music uh, use of motorcycles automobiles um, younger college students going to going to clubs, so all of those are going to be recreational activities that uh, have are associated with high high SPL levels. For example, for motorcycle usage, um, well, actually, all of those potentially could have an effect on OEs. So let me talk about one more specifically. Well, I'll talk about music in another section here in a moment. Um, let me just focus on a sporting event. So there was a study by Duat Swanepoel out of uh, South Africa, and he and Hall looked at both conventional and extended high-frequency audiometry and DPOAEs in 11 subjects uh, at, a, at a soccer game in South Africa. So this is going to be uh, very, very popular, similar to uh, many, many major uh, NFL football games, I guess, maybe even maybe even a uh, greater number of people there. I realize 11 subjects is a fairly small number, but I think it'll, you'll, you'll get the message here. The average sound level over that two-hour exposure period that they were there was about 100 dBA, uh, and those who were blowing uh, vuvuzelas had the highest noise exposure levels, and I didn't know what a, a vuvuzela was before uh, reading this study, and it's basically this long yellow horn that's quite popular at these soccer games. I thought that was kind of interesting. So I guess it, in, at football games you might be more likely to have a bullhorn. I guess that could be a similar uh, parallel we could draw. So we can see that uh, we pre our baseline OAEs pre and post uh, for blue for the pre OAEs and red for the post OAEs. We can see that there are significant changes. The figure on the right side shows that there was a significant reduction of about anywhere between one and a half to two and a half uh, dB on average um, across a wide frequency range. So a small change, but a significant change did occur, even after those two hour uh, two hours of noise exposure. Now it's very likely that uh, after. Uh, that the, the OAEs may return to baseline. That was probably just a temporary, temporary shift. Um, so music is another recreational sort of uh, noise exposure. It can also be occupational for musicians. Uh, the, the risk, the risk related to music exposure, is typically completely unrelated to the musical genre. I know you you might have. Um, 
you might have uh, patients that you, you might ask and what their history of noise exposure was, and they may think that because they go to the symphony or things like that, that they're not getting the noise exposure because it's uh, more, more, I guess, harmonious, uh, as opposed to uh, metal or something like that, or uh, uh, yeah, thrash metal. Um, so it doesn't matter the genre of music, uh, the risk is related to time and, uh, and intensity. So duration and, and level. So MP3 players are an area, kind of a hot topic, or they had been in recent years, uh, related to noise-induced hearing loss for college students and, and children. Um, and so the rise of the MP3 players has led to a uh, miniaturization of auditory personal uh, personal uh, personal listening devices, personal music devices. Uh, nowadays, it's typically on just on your phone, uh, but even even 10 years ago, iPods were, were I think, fairly popular. Um, and, and so this is just related to, again, uh, duration and level. So there have been studies that have looked at college students and the more the greater number of years they listen to, um, to music with, say, MP3 players, the greater the likelihood of hearing loss uh, being uh, that occurs. Um, one of the things that's changed besides miniaturization is also the rise of kind of the earbud. Um, the earbud wasn't really around, say, 20 years ago, and so especially these deep, uh, deep fitting earbuds with the silicone, non custom silicone ear tips, because they're positioned so much closer to the eardrop, uh, you're capable of producing much higher SPLs than uh, was possible previously with um, circumoral or superoral earphones. Uh, so that's a potential risk. That doesn't mean that someone is always going to listen to it at a higher level, but the data does seem to point in that direction. There has been a, a small but significant increase in the prevalence of pediatric hearing loss in recent years, and there are those who have attributed that to possibly to personal music devices or MP3 players. But I also mentioned that music exposure can be occupational. And an example, that uh, quite clear example that was outlined uh, in the chapter by Dar was uh, the classical musician. The classical musician is likely probably going to be playing music for more hours per day uh, in terms of performance and maybe during practice as well than uh, other types of musicians like rock musicians. And so the study by Hamden wanted to look at TEOAEs in professional singers, uh, as well as TEOAEs in normal audiometrically matched controls, and then a smaller sample of, of hearing impaired singers. And so these are the audiograms we have here. We can see that uh, for the normal hearing singers and normal hearing controls, their audiograms are matched, and we have a mild high frequency hearing loss for the hearing impaired singers. And so we go to the TEOAEs here, and we can see that um, we can see that really it's the high frequency TEOAEs that are affected. We see a clear difference between the normal hearing and hearing impaired singers. Uh, but, but what's more, more interesting probably is the difference you see between the normal hearing controls and normal hearing singers. We can see this trend at 4,000 hertz that where the, there's a reduced amplitude of 4,000 hertz TEO, TEOAEs for the singers, uh, likely attributed to a greater noise exposure due to the greater music exposure. So moving on from music, we can talk about tinnitus. So tinnitus we can define as uh, phantom auditory perception, so sounds that are, and most of the time we're talking about subjective tinnitus, that is tinnitus that's only audible to the, to the individual, not audible to anybody trying to measure or listen, it, listen to it. Um, it really starts to become a problem when it affects quality of life for an individual, and a lot of times uh, a signifier of this would be sleep disturbances. So that's typically going to be um, uh, pathognomonic to uh, like debilitating tinnitus. Is you're oftentimes going to have these sleep disturbances. The, now the vast majority of people with tinnitus do not have quality of life uh, being impacted. So greater than 80% of those who do experience tinnitus, uh, there's, there's, t and there's typically no underlying active disease process present. Um, so what I mean here is it's typically just related to aging or noise exposure. It's usually not related to um, uh, 
act like a, like a cochlear metabolic uh, issues or uh, I'm sorry, I take that back. It's usually not related to otologic disease is what I meant to say. So it's usually not related to uh, tumors or Meniere's disease or things like that. Um, often tinnitus is associated with cochlear dysfunction, secondary to aging, noise exposure, I just said that. Um, damage to outer hair cells and or inner hair cells tends to disrupt auditory afferent fibers resting activity. So kind of one theory is that um, when you have a disruption, noise-induced damage to outer hair cells or inner hair cells, the, uh, the resting activity maybe increases for these afferent nerve fibers, creating the sensation of tinnitus. Um, and also neural reorganization plays a role here too when you have permanent hearing loss and there are some neurons that are um, no, longer, no longer associated with, uh, with active inner hair cells and they may, uh, may change functions. So normally, uh, normal or, normally OEEs are not normal in, ten, in those who have tinnitus, and especially with those who have the chief complaint of tinnitus. Um, they may be present, uh, but they're usually lower than normal, usually lower than, say, that 90% normative range. DPOAEs are probably a better choice for measuring tinnitus than TEOAEs because we're able to go into the higher frequency spectrum. We can't really get above 5,000 hertz with TEOAEs. With DPOAEs, we can get to 6 or 8,000 hertz. With new equipment on the market, maybe 10,000 hertz, maybe even higher in the future. Definitely with experimental equipment, you can get up to 16,000 hertz. I don't know that that's hit the commercial market yet, though. Now, while there is an association between the uh, tinnitus pitch match, so there's a, a procedure that you can do during tinnitus assessment where you're basically trying to find out uh, what pitch their tinnitus is. You're trying to match it to a tone maybe in the contralateral ear, for example, or maybe a narrowband noise signal in the contralateral ear. And so there is some association between the tinnitus pitch, pitch match and the frequency regions where there's damage, or I'm sorry, where there's absent OAEs. Um, it's not a perfect association by any means. So, uh, for example, the mo a common pitch, a tinnitus pitch, would be around 6,000 hertz. Um, we might have absent OAEs at 6,000 and 4,000 hertz, or maybe just 8,000 hertz. So it's not a perfect relationship. A lot of times when we look at these things, we do a kind of post hoc. We say, oh, that makes sense. And when, we, when, they, when it doesn't make sense, when they don't match, we really kind of forget about those. So uh, those are just some kind of, uh, uh, kind of a cognitive bias that we tend to have. Um, where OEs can be really useful is cases of unilateral tinnitus. So, say for example, you've got somebody that comes in, they have a normal audiogram, and tinnitus is their chief complaint, and it's really, really bothering them. And this is affecting their quality of life. This is the type of person you might look at using noise generators in combination with uh, cognitive behavioral therapy to, to address those issues. And for, for, those, uh, for those patients, um, you know, do you use noise generators bilaterally or unilaterally is, is a question. Now, they perceive they have unilateral tinnitus, but do they really have unilateral tinnitus or do they have bilateral tinnitus, but the tinnitus percept is just greater in one ear than the other? And so the, the, the reason that matters is you'd want to use, uh, if they had bilateral tinnitus, which would be consistent with bilateral, fairly symmetrical uh, deficits in OAEs or reductions in OAEs, um, then you might want to use bilateral noise generators. If it truly was unilateral tinnitus, which is less common, um, then you could probably get away with um, you know, a single ear noise generator. Uh, so, so the authors of the chapter, Dar and Hall, mentioned that you can, you, know, you can use OAEs to try this out. Now, of course, if you didn't use OAEs, you could just compare one versus two noise generators as well. So that wouldn't be that big of a deal. But it's an interesting idea. It certainly is. Um, typically, another thing to mention with tinnitus, when we use DPOEs with tinnitus, this is where we might want to use a greater number of... Um, of uh, points per octave, so greater frequency resolution. Uh, it takes a longer time, but it also gives us uh, better information about 
out of her cell function because sometimes what we see is is these patterns in OEEs where we have these dips sometimes they're not related to actual cochlear dysfunction they could just be related to the interaction between the two components uh, remember the wave fixed and place fixed components of the DPOAE and so if you're measuring a greater number of points per octave you might be able to pick up on that and, uh, and I think in previous chapters they had mentioned you could maybe use input-output functions for, for, for tinnitus uh, sufferers. The, the, one of the main things I'm going to say with DPOAEs, using DPOAEs for tinnitus sufferers, is really going to be validation of their complaint. Because the problem with tinnitus sufferers is so often they've been to their primary care physician or even their e an ENT physician, and they've said, you know, there's nothing you can do about it, just live with it. Then, and, and oftentimes in audiology, you see people saying, oh, you can't say that. It's a horrible thing to say. It's malpractice to say that. And I can kind of see both sides of the, the relationship. I mean, it's true. There's really no medication or surgery that's going to typically be effective for any, uh, any useful length of duration of time um, for the vast majority of tinnitus sufferers. But at the same time, uh, you know, when there are treatment options that have some reasonable effectiveness or efficacy data, you want to consider those, and those are going to be things like cognitive behavioral therapy, number one, and use of um, uh, sound generators, uh, you know, in what, what exact, uh, you know, philosophy you have varies related to tinnitus, but those are kind of the two, two things that work together. Counseling, I guess, more generically, and sound generators. And so, um, Getting sidetracked there, so we do, might do pitch matching similarly with O8 with uh, with to validate the um, the complaint of tinnitus, but by showing the person that has a normal audiogram that they have abnormal OAEs, they might say, "Oh wow, now there's actual uh, objective documentation that I have some issue, some physiologic problem. It wasn't all in my head. It wasn't a psychiatric disturbance. It is actually a, physio a physiologic disturbance." So OE is another area to use it would be for malingering. I, I would say this is probably, um, you know, very, very important in children in particular, but uh, important in certain populations of adults. Uh, with You can use OAEs to decrease the likelihood that a non-organic patient is diagnosed with sensory neural hearing loss. A few studies are reviewed in the chapter. So um, uh, one, one example was if the person knows you're doing an OAE, say prior to your pure tone audiogram, and they know this is an objective test that they have no control over the outcome, maybe they're less likely to feign that um, that that change in their, the feign the hearing loss or the exaggeration of the hearing loss. I think that's a reasonable idea. Um, another another possibility would be that person who has you know uh, who has a normal audiogram and they're faking a hearing loss. You'll see robust OAEs. The problem is if the person already has a moderate hearing loss and they're just exaggerating that hearing loss. I think you see that a lot in the VA populations, or you can see that a lot in the VA populations when it comes to pension and compensation exams. Um, and so that wouldn't be probably wouldn't have as much value in that in that setting, um, but it's it, it's it's a useful useful uh, test to add to your test battery. Um, so you, you know there are some examples in the chapter. I think uh, they're very rare. They happen, but I think they're very rare, where you have uh, these cases of uh, non-organic hearing loss leading to um, you know inappropriate diagnoses and fitting with hearing aids, or you have non-organic hearing losses uh, that are related to legal claims. Um, you, you know, I would say the, the legal claims one is probably much more likely than the psychogenic hearing loss in the adult. Although, you know, there are cases of those. There are ca case studies of uh, psychogenic hearing losses. You know, these are typically people who, have, who do have uh, mental illness and, uh, and they, they're not intentionally feigning the hearing loss. It is psychological, uh, but not, not willful. Um, and OAEs can help in the differential diagnosis. But again, I would argue that for, uh, for the uh, non-intentional psychiatric or mental health disturbances, I would say it's a very, fairly uncommon thing. Um, 
but it does happen. And then the medical legal claims, there are certain people, I mean, if anybody comes into your clinic and they mention, I was in a car accident, my hearing changed, that should be a red flag to you to, um, uh, to make sure to do additional objective testing, for example, OAEs, reflexes, um, maybe ASSR or something like that. Um, anytime there's a lawyer involved, you probably want to do additional objective testing, uh, kind of cross your T's and dot your I's, because they may require you to um, submit some type of letter uh, attesting to the, their hearing loss, and that's up to you to diagnose it properly. Um, is, is there's a relationship between um, uh, idiopathic sudden onset sensory neural hearing loss, which is very interesting in OAEs. A lot of times idiopathic just means that we don't know what the cause was. And uh, so it's a very long name for just saying, you know, it's inner ear hearing loss and we have no idea why. Uh, viruses are oftentimes suspected, especially if they're associated around the same time that the person like comes down with a cold or some kind of illness. Uh, also vascular etiologies are suspected, so um, a reduction in blood flow and oxygen, oxygen and glucose to the cochlea could lead to deprivation uh, to the hair cells and they may die. Um, the idea here is that say you have this sudden onset sensory neural loss, if OAEs are present, especially if they're normal, shortly after the idiopathic sudden onset sensory neural hearing loss, it's, it signifies a greater chance of hearing recovery uh, over a relatively short period of time. I think this is a very, very interesting finding. I think this is a, an area that we need, um, probably should have more research related to OAEs. I don't know if this is one of those things that's not ready for prime time, where the data isn't quite good enough for us to do this on a regular clinical basis. I suspect that's the case. Um, it's been a while since I've read the paper on this, papers on that, but I do suspect that's the case, that you're probably not going to see people doing this clinically, but it's a very interesting area of research. It would be great if you could predict who who's likely to recover. The patient would really appreciate that, I suspect. And then you'd know uh, who to, who you need to wait longer periods of time on for treatment and who you can pursue uh, treatment more aggressively with for these uh, people with single-sided deafness. Um, imaging a lot of times will be done with, sync with uh, idiopathic sudden onset sensory neural hearing loss. Usually a common course is to prescribe steroids right away and, uh, and then do imaging to try to rule out the presence of a tumor. Um, so, yep. Um, OAEs can be helpful in separating between, I don't know, I, I, th this is mentioned in the textbook chapter and and I suppose this is true, but I, I, I don't really buy this that much, that OAEs can, are, are very helpful in separating idiopathic sudden onset sensory neural hearing loss from the sudden onset conversion deafness. Um, I, I, I have that on there that was in the book. I'm, I think that's pretty fishy. I don't think that's very likely because you can have uh, people with, as mentioned in the previous statement, you can have persons with idiopathic sudden onset sensory neural hearing loss with, with OAEs that are normal and that signifies the greater likelihood of recovery or you can have them be completely absent. Similarly with conversion deafness, the person could have completely normal cochlear function uh, and so they may have no OAEs present or with conversion deafness, they may have already have a mild physiologic hearing loss with the conversion deafness on top of that. And so they maybe they don't have OEs anyways. So I think, eh, I, I'm not on board with that one. Um, Meniere's disease. This is also a really interesting uh, one. Again, uh, and this might be something that to be done clinically right away if, if the ENT physician that you're working with um, uses the glycerol test. So we know with Meniere's disease, it's I think most often unilateral, but it can be bilateral. In some cases, you'll have, um, it, it'll be, it seem like it's unilateral, but you might may actually have the, what seems to be the unaffected ear may be affected, but to just a much lesser extent and maybe subclinical, the symptoms over there. Um, so OAEs are typically abnormal or absent in these populations, but you can, um, in, in about 20 to 30% of these patients, OAEs might be normal, 
uh, even when you have mild to moderate sensory neural hearing loss. And this is very interesting because this suggests that you might actually have different subtypes of Meniere's disease. So maybe for those people who are being clinically diagnosed with Meniere's disease, remember there's not really any great objective test for Meniere's disease. It's a cluster of symptoms. It's kind of a, um, a, diag it's a diagnosis based on exclusion of other, other diagnoses. It's, it's the best fit, I guess. Um, so, because most of the tests that you might do to diagnose Meniere's disease, things like your audiogram, electrocochleography, the glycerol test, none of them are all that great. And it's really the ENT that's diagnosing Meniere's disease based on this cluster of symptoms. But anyways, this glycerol test is used to diagnose whether or not the problem, the hearing loss, was due to endolymphatic hydrops, which is associated, was commonly associated with Meniere's disease. The idea is you administer glycerol to the patient. This dehydrates them. Uh, so basically the, uh, the endocochlear hydrops go away. They, they don't have this excessive fluid in the scala media anymore and their hearing improves. So if you have a positive outcome on this glycerol test, you see improvements in the audiogram. Well, the problem with this is that when the person takes the glycerol, they feel terrible afterward. They feel like they have, they're all hung over. They feel, you know, just awful. Uh, so maybe OAEs could be a uh, substitute for a pure tone audiogram because then they don't have to participate in that. And, and I think the uh, studies are very positive uh, that support the use of that. I'd like, I'd be very interested in seeing if that was, uh, if how often that is used clinically. I suspect probably not often, but um, I would be hopeful that that could be something that could be used clinically in the, in the near future. Um, again, this wouldn't be, but this wouldn't be useful for those uh, 80 percent, 70 to 80 percent of people who have no OEEs at all, it would be less useful for those people. Um, or I, I guess it could be if, if they recovered, if the OEEs recovered. Um, so I don't know. This is something that's just a very interesting, interesting um, uh, kind of a supplement to this glycerol test. So keep an eye on that in the future. Um, similar to children, we can use OEEs to monitor ototoxicity. Um, it's not quite as useful in adults as it is in children because in adults a lot more often they can participate and they can they can engage in pure tone audiometry and they can engage in uh, we can use extended high frequency audiometry which is arguably better maybe than, than DPOAEs. Um, adults but again then adults may also feel terrible after their treatment of, of uh, chemotherapy and so OEEs might be useful for some patients uh, in, that, in those situations. Uh, but the problem is adults are also just more likely not to have OEEs to begin with because of their age, because of their noise exposure. We know there's a relationship between age and cancer, and so we would expect that uh, those people who are the most likely to have um, cancer are going to be the oldest, and they're also the most likely to have no OEEs. So in those cases, probably... Uh, um, uh, we can see why conventional audiometry and extended high frequency audiometry might be the preferred choice but it, it, you can you can use it as well though it's it's good to have it as an option and then the vestibular schwannoma is to kind of tie this back into the case study that I mentioned previously when I was talking about a meningioma um, I mentioned er, so early interest in using OAEs related to vestibular schwannomas was for intraoperative monitoring. So intraoperative monitoring is where um, there's a either a technician or a, uh, or, a, or a neurophysiologist who's monitoring the neurophysiologic signals coming from, say, aud the auditory brain stem when we're looking at um, the removal of a, say, vestibular schwannoma or meningioma. But could you also use OAEs to monitor cochlear function during surgery? Um, and, and the answer is probably it's not really a great idea. There's problems with noise levels, with not having OAEs to begin with. Um, it, it's not really a great option. They've looked into it and not great. But it might be good to use to, for, for people who, who are diagnosed with having, say, vestibular schwannoma, um, but you want to see whether or not outer hair cell function is affected. Again, I mentioned a uh, uh, previous class with a case study how having, having OAEs present uh, with that meningioma had an impact on the surgeon's choice of the surgical procedure uh, and, and, the, um, and the likelihood of hearing preservation occurring. So when OEs are normal, hearing preservation is more likely, and that may affect the surgeon's uh, surgical approach.
And that's all I've got to wrap up for this chapter. Uh, I will go ahead and put a study guide on there, uh, and then over probably over the weekend here. Um, and you can feel free to email me if you have any questions.